This is Patriot to the Core Podcast. I'm your host, Thad Forrester. Thank you for listening and welcome to episode number 16. I hope you have had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend. And I'm sure those of you that do this, the normal Monday to the Friday job are excited to go back to work this Monday morning. Not, uh, But anyway, I have a, got a great guest today, Mark Esposito, who is a combat controller in the Air Force. And so I'm going to bring him on and let him talk about his injury from an IED back in 2009, talk about his recovery, some of the activities that he was involved in, you know, the Warrior Games, the Sea to Shining Sea, um, bike ride across the entire country, uh, and just his attitude and kind of how he helped recover physically and mentally and and uh, just the good that he's doing now. All right, so I've got with me Mark Esposito, and uh, Mark, it is great having you with me today. Great to be here. Thanks. Uh, are you in the great state of Texas? I am in the great state of Texas and uh, enjoying this fall uh, weather. It's actually starting to cool down. Okay, good. It's It's been... I know here it's been warm for too long. It's been unseasonably warm, so I'm just kind of kind of ready for the cooler weather. Um, but yeah, it's great to have you. You are uh, you, you've been, definitely been on the list of people I've wanted to interview for a while, actually since the inception of the podcast. And uh, we've we've you know had some challenges with scheduling, so glad to be with you. And um, I wanted to go ahead and and maybe just kind of just get right into it. Just talk about your your injury in 2009. Uh, I had posted about you on Mark's website back in uh, 2011, early that year, when I first learned about you. And uh, but I'd like for you, if you would, wouldn't mind just explaining to us, like, you know, about your deployment and then about the the pretty serious injury that you got. All right, yeah, I'd, I'd love to share. Um, so, um, basic story is I, you know, came in came in the Air Force in 2004. Uh, Came in to be a combat controller and uh, made it through the pipeline. Um, been on several teams and uh, found myself in Afghanistan in 2009 um, doing the job I, uh, I feel so passionate about. And um, You know, we were on a combat reconnaissance patrol um, looking for some bad guys. And we ended up uh, rolling over an IED and the IED went off kind of right under the position I was in in the Humvee in the back. Um, I was manning a 240 Bravo machine gun and um, doing my job, and uh, all of a sudden it was just uh, it was like a light switch. It was just lights out at that point. And uh, the next the next memory I had was waking up in a, in a big, quiet, white room in uh, Lonstel, Germany, in the hospital there. And uh, it was it was as if this was a, a dream. And that that's when the you know, realization of all the things that happened and um, everything kind of came to. But uh, what had actually happened that day on the uh, 26th of May 2009 was uh, the IED went off and it ended up ejecting me from the Humvee, or the back of the Humvee, and throwing me forward um, immediately. Uh, like a lot of my other buddies, um, you know, both my lower legs were shattered. Uh, and the tibula and amphibia, um, a bunch of the metatarsals were broken in, in each feet, and then uh, my right heel was fractured. Um, the force uh, then went up the rest of my body, and um, it ended up being like a compression fracture in my lower back. Um, and then uh, a few small burns on uh, my legs and my wrists, uh, basically places that weren't covered with uh, that flame retardant multicam that we that we wore, and uh, and then I was knocked out for um, quite a while. So my first memories, like I said, were you know being on the mission, doing everything I was supposed to be doing, and then waking up in a hospital in Germany. And at the time, uh, you know getting blown up or getting shot or getting getting being killed uh was you know kind of in essence something that you can accept um you know the job was um worth it um you had pride and purpose in and you know everything we do and everything we did then and um you know we we, we knew that it was worth the the risks and the one thing that i never accounted for and 
the things that a lot of my my buddies who have gone through you know similar or worse um, stories as, like mine is that you know you never account for you know what if you get hurt um, that's never never even crosses your mind um, so it's kind of like um, a, a total restart you you're totally restarting uh, everything um, you go from being on top of the world being totally in control being basically the most uh, capable weapon system that the US military has as a combat controller and going to nothing basically something or a person or a thing that has to be totally taken care of and is totally reliant on those who surround you and uh that's probably one of the biggest pills to swallow um you know getting wounded and and coming back and being totally reliant on those around you um you know myself i one of the things i had to do in germany was uh, besides pick out some clothes because I got there, I had, I didn't have anything. Um, one of the, one of the things I had to do is, you know, call my family and, uh, and let them know what happened. And initially probably for a day, they, you know, begged and pleaded with me that, you know, call them, call them, you know, you have to call them. Somebody has got to know. And I was like, no, no, I'll wait. Like it still hadn't occur- occurred to me, like the, the magnitude of, of what happened. And, um, you know, the, the road, the recovery and how long it was actually going to last. This was something that, you know, up front I was like, well, I'll let them know when I get a little better and then it won't be so bad. And, uh, it's probably one of the dumbest things you could do. Um, now as a parent realizing, you know, how much you care and, and love your kids and and you want to know, you know, about their well being and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely owe it to my parents to, um, give them a call next time if that ever happens. But, uh, so I had to give them a call in Germany, um, let them know what had happened. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, that's, that was the first memories I had after being, uh, blown up. And then, you know, I remember everything, uh, very, very clearly. Um, I, you know, even the, the parts of being really like drugged up and, you know, semi-conscious, like basically talking to someone in the hospital and then like just kind of passing out. And then, um, it was, it was kind of humorous at times. Like I'd be talking to a social worker and my dad would be talking to me and he'd tell me I'd just like fall asleep and they'd look at him and he'd like shrug his shoulders. (laughs) But, uh, yeah. Um, so So Mark, before you got there or, or after the injury, were you on fire? So, I wasn't exactly on fire. Um, the, the medic, the, uh, army 18 Delta that was on my team, um, who recovered me said he watched the explosion. He was in the Humvee right behind me. Um, watched the explosion, um, watched me go flying. Um, and he found me and I was, uh, smoking like, not like smoldering or anything like that, but like he said, there's a bunch of like smoke and stuff coming off me and, uh, and, when he got to me, you know, they moved me to a, a position that was a little bit further away from the Humvee, which was on fire, and you know, all these different secondary explosions were going off because of the the weapons and the gasoline and all the other things we had in the Humvee. But uh, he said when he moved me to a secure position, they they were trying to you know assess my injuries. I was totally unresponsive. Um, he couldn't really detect any breathing or a heartbeat at the time, so he did some things. Uh, that day that, you know, whether or not, you know, he actually saved my life. He, uh, he's definitely responsible for, I think how I recovered, um, just because of things he did on that day, um, on the ground. But yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask you too, then before we talk about maybe the recovery is, I mean, obviously, you know the risk involved with your job, but in that area that you were in, was it an active area? Had there been many incidents like this already? Uh, you know, what was it like? What did you know leading up to this injury? Well, leading up to this injury, I think, uh, uh, I mean, it, just like I said before, it's something you never uh, plan on. You never plan on being the one that gets hurt. Um 
it's just never something that even crosses your mind. You're, you're the one that, you know, if you're going to go out, you're going to go out big and, you know, you're not going to come back injured, but, um, it's something, like I said, I didn't plan on, I didn't prepare for, uh, and it was certainly uh, a surprise to me. However, um, in the operations and in the area that we were working, um, we had recovered an IED every single time we would leave our forward operating base. And it was to a point where it was just kind of like, oh, there's another IED. Okay, well, we're going to go set a, you know, set some stuff up and then we're going to recover it and we're going to go bring it back and like look at it and find out who put it there. And, um, it was just, you know, normal ops. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, uh, what was your recovery like and how many surgeries have you had? And do you still have more upcoming, all that good stuff? So I didn't have nearly as many surgeries as some of my, some of my buddies who went through this similar, uh, case, but I had a few surgeries in Germany, um, and once stabilized and um, ready to be moved and flown back to uh, the U.S. at Walter Reed, um, I got back to Walter Reed and I had uh, three surgeries um, to reset my legs, and uh, I'd say the last one was was the worst one where they finally took off the the X fix I had on my left leg. And, uh, surgery went well, uh, you know, everything was good until about 12 to 13 hours after the surgery, um, when all that medication and everything basically came down and, uh, it went through a couple hours of just the most excruciating pain I think I've ever felt in my entire life. Um, that was the worst, but, um, since then, I have been lucky enough to not have to go back and, and do any surgeries. The uh, hardware that they put in my ankles and in my legs um, is all looking good. And um, as of right now, I don't, I don't plan on going and getting any surgeries done on my legs. But, uh, yeah, that was that was the extent of, of those. It was about a month and a half I spent inpatient in the hospital uh, and then I spent about another four to five months in a wheelchair doing therapy back and forth before I actually was able to stand up for the first time. Um, and that was a pretty big step for me. Um, the day they told me I was going to stand up, I didn't believe them because I was like, ah, I don't know about this guys. Like, so, um, yeah. So do you have full mobility with your ankles? And knees. Right, right now, I do not have full mobility with my ankles. Um, luckily, my knees didn't suffer uh, any uh, lasting injuries. I uh, I do not have full mobility in the ankles. Um, really challenges me when I'm trying to squat or do any kind of Olympic lifting. Um, I usually have to do something with like a heel lift or have some kind of lifting shoe with a with a greater angle on it. Um, but you know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, loss of range of motion is better than, you know, what it could have been. Um, and I've been lucky enough not to have any fusions in either of my legs. So I definitely count myself pretty lucky for that. Yeah. I mean, you've adapted very well, obviously based on everything you've taken part in since then. And, and some of it was, it seemed like it was, pretty quick turnaround from you know your recovery to maybe some of your uh, rides you've done at the warrior games or the plenty the other several events you've taken part in so i think i was very very lucky in a sense that the way things played out throughout my recovery and the opportunities that i was given uh allowed me to kind of excel in my recovery um recovery for for men and women that come back from these kinds of injuries whether it be civilian you know car accident or, or military um it every single thing is depends on you know so many different factors um but you know throughout my recovery you know initially when i could start actually doing things to you know elevate my heart rate or to actually do any kind of like workouts 
um, I was just super hungry for it. Like, like, every, like everybody that would, um, be in recovery with me. Uh, I found people who, um, would do recovery with me that, you know, whether it be someone like me, that's more of like a limb salvage case or someone that's missing both their legs. Um, like the whole group of us in, in therapy would do, you know, modified CrossFit workouts so that everybody could finish the workout. And, um, that group motivation would certainly push me. But, um, the whole time I was in recovery, uh, the whole time I was, you know, my commanders would call me or, um, family would ask or anybody at all would ask. Uh, my, my goal was always to recover and to get back to doing my job. And, uh, you know, for a long time I wanted to do it, you know, for selfish reasons. I want to get back and do the job. I want to get back and be on a team and I want to go back and go after bad guys. Um, but, um, really I can I kind of like through all the questions of, you know, why I or anyone would ever want to go back to doing something, you know, where they got hurt like I did, um, you know, answering those, those folks, um, kind of came to a realization one day that, you know, I'm definitely not doing this for me or for all this different stuff. I'm doing this for the pride and the purpose that I get, um, being able to put on the uniform and go out and do the job I'm doing, whether it be here in Texas training the next generations of uh, Air Force Special Operations guys that go out there and, and be effective, or whether it be you know getting actually getting back on that team. Um, there, there are so many different things uh, in the kill chain um, in the military that that contribute to you know success on the battlefield. Um, you know, I'm still you know, selfishly trying to get back to a team and, and do the things that, you know, you, you get to do on the teams and, and take care of the guys. Um, now more so as a leader than I ever have, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to, to chase my dream of becoming an officer. And, um, I, I was, uh, I commissioned earlier this, this year and, uh, uh, yeah, like I said, when I go back to a team now, it's, it's not so much about myself. It's about enabling the the men around me to to do the mission, to supporting them, however a, a team leader can, and mm -hmm. um, that that's been like my ever uh, my 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 dream, I guess you could say, for the last seven years, uh, ever since being injured. So, what would you describe your you know what's going on in your head, your mental strength and emotional strength? Um, I mean, has it always been pretty positive? Have you had your ups and downs? And have those lows, if you've had them, been, you know, for long periods? Uh, I think out of pure stubbornness, I've uh, avoided the lows as much as possible. Um, however, I've, I've definitely I've definitely hit, you know, my rock bottom in, in a lot of, you know, cases uh, in my recovery. Um, you know, the drugs they give you for pain are uh, something that, you know, we all that everybody that has to overcome some kind of injury will eventually have to overcome the pain medications. And, uh, you know, it's something that I think the awareness of it helped, um, and, and knowing basically what, what they were doing. Um, you know, they're, they're good to, you know, relieve that pain, but at some point you just got to stop. Yeah, and yeah, and yeah. For, for me, it was just like coming back from the pharmacy one day at a, like a, a full size grocery bag full of like all these pills and drugs and all stuff. And I was just like, screw this. And I just like throwing the bag away and being like, all right, let's do this. And for the next two, two and a half weeks, basically being restless, you know, sleepless and then being totally fatigued and hungry and sick. And I mean, all these different things you go through and withdrawals, um, you know, after that was, uh, it was like, it was like being reborn again or something like it was just totally better. Like you just felt better. You felt energized. And that's when I actually started, um, getting the motivation to train and do, do whatever I could to recover. Hmm. So you had, you didn't have a dependency on anything anymore. Yeah. Um, it's something that I had to break. Um, and everybody, like I said, that goes through this, it's, it's something you have to break. Uh, the human body works in so many funny ways, um, and everything's in, a, in cycles. And unfortunately, that cycle that it, 
you get in with those drugs, um, what, what I've looked up and, and found is that it's going to take 30 to 45 days for you to get off of any kind of cycle of uh, pain medications or medications in general. So it's at 30, 30 to 45 days of just sucking it up and getting through it because you know at the end it's going to be better that that you have to go through. And uh, you know, I'll never forget. I mean, you just, you'd be riding in a car and like throw up because you're sick or something. And it's like, God, what the heck's going on with me? But um, like I said, the awareness, the awareness of that kind of, kind of helped because I mean, the entire time, you, I mean, you know what your body's doing, you know what you're, you, what you're going through, and that, that to me at least helped out. Yeah, uh, that's incredible discipline. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I applaud you for that. Um, so what about when you? Maybe I don't know what you want to talk about first: the Warrior Games, or maybe one of the the rides from you know across the country. I'd like to talk about a few of those things you've done since, and how, and how that, you know, how that helped your recovery and your 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 spirit. Yeah. So, with the the Wounded Warrior events, um, it was so this is May twenty sixth, two thousand nine. I got hurt. This was probably spring, uh, spring two thousand ten, when I was a. Uh, Finally at the Center for the Intrepid in uh, San Antonio and doing my therapy and I was, you know, I was ramping it up. I was, I was trying to push it, you know, every day doing therapy and, um, you know, just continually work. And I didn't need a goal. I didn't need, you know, my goal was to get back to a team, but I didn't have any like stair steps. I didn't have anything like really to train for in the meantime. I was just basically training three, four hours a day, like, in therapy and uh and then someone told me about the warrior games it was the first year they were going to do these warrior games and i was like huh warrior games um that sounds pretty cool like i found out a little bit more about it it was going to be in colorado springs it's going to be at the olympic training center you know all these different things that i would just kept being like oh whoa whoa yeah like that sounds awesome like i love colorado i think that would be pretty awesome to go to the olympic training center and train with those guys and and just to have that opportunity is like once a lifetime opportunity. So, so I agreed to doing it. I, I, I went out for the air force team, um, at the time, special operations didn't have a team. And, uh, you know, I went out, uh, we did a lot of figuring out when we went out there and, um, I have to back up a little bit as I was preparing for the warrior games. Um, I also learned about this cross country bike ride. Um, and cycling was a huge part of my recovery. Uh, prior to being injured, I'd, um, I had a triathlon bike and I'd done a bunch of triathlons and, uh, it's something I never really thought I'd, I honestly ne- never thought I'd get back to, but, uh, I love to cycle. I, I just didn't, I couldn't run and then swimming was a lot of fun. So, um, I found out about this, this cross country bike ride from San Francisco to Virginia beach. And I was just like, that sounds absolutely insane. Um, it was advertised 4,000 miles and they were going to do it and you're going to ride every single inch of it. And I was like all about that. That was, that was like way to me, that was like the best thing. So, you know, training for the warrior games, I was training to race in the bike race for the warrior games. And then, uh, about two weeks after the warrior games was going to be this, this cross country bike ride. And, uh, and so I found myself in Colorado um, you know, competed for the Warrior Games, uh, for the Air Force team in the Warrior Games 2010. Um, I ended up getting third place in the cycling, uh, race. And then immediately after the cycling race, they threw us in vans and brought us back to the Olympic Training Center. And, uh, we only had so many, uh, people on the Air Force team. So I had to shoot as well in the pistol standing, stand up pistol competition. I'm not sure what they call it. <laughs> but uh, I went out there and uh, I outshot all the uh, Marines and the Army guys and the Navy guys, and I like to give them crap about it, but they shot very well, and I just shot better. And uh, and I got a golden shooting, and then um, I think the next day we did uh, swimming, and I and I placed uh, first in the swimming as well. And and it was great to get out there and, and compete in the Warrior Games, uh, partly because it was. It was a competition. It was, one, it was the first competition I'd competed in since being injured. 
it was something to aim towards when I was training and it was just off the wall amazing um you know staying at, at the time we were staying at the Olympic training center we were we were swimming in the Olympic pools we were shooting in the Olympic you know firing range we were we were just doing all this stuff that like I said was just a once in a lifetime opportunity I just was like wow this is unbelievable and I hadn't done any wounded warrior activities prior to that. I was totally like, leave me alone. I don't want to do this stuff. Like, I just want to do therapy. And the only thing I care about is getting back to a team. Um, so, you know, I didn't realize at the time how much that was motivating me to get back to basically the level I'm at. And, um, you know, that's, that's what's going to make the difference between, uh, you know, how much you, you recover is those little things to shoot for, like the Warrior Games or, um, you know, they have new things now like the Invictus Games. Uh, I've never actually participated in, but they're they're unbelievable. They're even better than the Warrior Games uh, or they're awesome. Um, but two weeks after the Warrior Games, I, uh, I started the uh, Sea to Shining Sea bike ride. Um, State Farm funded it. Uh, along with uh, lots of other people. And uh, it took us from Virginia Beach. I'm sorry. It took us from San Francisco, the coast of San Francisco, to Virginia Beach. Um, and that was one of those things that, I mean, like the Warrior Games were, was cool, like going to Colorado and doing all that stuff. That was cool. Um, but that bike ride, the cross-country bike ride, was just totally unbelievable almost the entire time. Um like I remember flying out there and being like, I I don't believe this is gonna happen. Like I can't believe it. Like I flew from <laughs> I flew from North Carolina and I'm like I'm in the plane and I'm like looking out the plane and I'm like I'm gonna fly. I'm gonna ride my bicycle across the entire country. That I just can't believe this. Like this is actually happening. And I mean, getting to San Francisco and riding around in San Francisco, and, like preparing things, getting the bikes all tuned up for that. I think we, we arrived like two or three days early, but just getting everything like ready to go and like learning about, you know, the, the volunteers that had helped out and who would be with us for the next 60 days. And then I, it was just totally unbelievable. I, I, I couldn't believe what was about to happen. Um, and that was uh, World Team Sports that put that on. Uh, and, and those folks are just amazing what they uh, what they were able to do that year. Um, never have I heard of or seen anything like that in uh and like an event that was for wounded warriors and it took a it took a ton of effort um and and that was certainly part of my recovery that is one of the reasons why i got back to where i'm at um but yeah i mean we started off in in california um you know before we took off uh at the time robin williams he's a huge cyclist um he's a cyclist for a lot of his life actually um he rode with us for i think the first two legs which i think took us into like almost nearly 100 miles so the first leg was like 40 miles or something and then the second leg was like 60 miles and yeah robin williams rode with us and talked with us and made jokes the entire time um and we got to know him better than a lot of people ever get to and i'm telling you what the guy was even funnier in person <laughs> he was just uh he's an unbelievable human being um he's a very very good person um, so, so that was again, just unbelievable. And, and I mean, it was across the entire country, uh, just an unbelievable trip. We, uh, we started off doing like 40, 50 mile legs and, um, you know, the first week I think we got into like the 60 or 70 mile, we did like a 60 or 70 mile leg and these are like repeating day after day after day. And, like there's days like at the beginning you're just so sore from sitting on a bike the entire time or your uh -huh. leg, ankles or whatever. And I mean these are recovering wounded warriors doing this, and it's just uh, it's just unbelievable. But the more we rode, the stronger we got, and the stronger we got, the more fun it became, and the faster we got, and um, it was just unbelievable um, to the point where we were doing back to back 100 you know, century plus rides, you know, day after day. And, 
you know, we were getting done at three or four o'clock in the afternoon and being like, well, all right, what else are we going to do? Like the longest ride I think we did was uh, 140 miles into some town in Nevada. Um, I think it was Austin, Nevada, actually. Um, I can't even remember the route we were on, but uh, just unbelievable how we felt at the end of that ride. Um, I think the biggest hill climbing day was into uh, Tahoe. It was 8,000 and some feet. And then the three the three most or three days of most consecutive climbing um, or three most consecutive days of climbing were uh, coming right the three days after Pittsburgh, believe it or not. And uh, that was uh, close to 21,000 feet. Um, so it was uh, – it was an unbelievable opportunity. It was just day after day seeing American flags all over the place. Um, every town we would roll through, um, you know, especially closer to the East Coast where there was more towns. Um, I mean, you, we saw thousands and thousands of Americans come out and spend time just to see us ride by or to see us arrive at our final destination, eat dinner with us and talk with us and it was uh, is a group of I think sixteen of us finished, and it was uh, it was an unbelievable opportunity. So, Mark, what, what kind of bike were you using? So, at the time, I was actually riding my my tri bike. Um, it was a Cervelo, uh, my first ever tri bike. It was a Cervelo P two C. I bought it when I was in Okinawa, Japan, and uh, I rode that bike everywhere. And uh, it was actually really good for for this ride. Um, as a matter of fact, it died on this ride, uh, because, uh, I think it was in Somerset or Summerlin, Somerset County in Pennsylvania. Uh, I actually got hit by a car <laughs> and, <laughs> I uh, read about this. I was totally fine. Um, and again, I didn't want to tell my mom, but I ended up calling and telling her and, um, I was, I was totally fine, but my bike was, my, my bike was pretty smashed up. So... <laughs> Um, State Farm ended up uh, stepping in and making sure I got another Cervelo like, the very next day. So um, I'm actually still, I think I'm on, that was my first Cervelo. And right now I think I'm on my fourth one. Um, and cycling has been a huge part of my life. Um, and I've gotten to do, you know, other Wounded Warrior rides more or less as a, a support kind of guy for for the for guys who have never done this or guys or girls who have never actually had the opportunity um and cycling has just been huge it's been an absolute uh miracle in my recovery as far as i'm concerned because it doesn't matter how long or how hard or how fast i was riding i always felt better afterwards and you know that that movement that it, it gave my ankles the uh, circulation that it increased in my ankles i, I really think that that is the entire reason why I recovered the way I did. And, um, you know, growing up, I never really liked skinny tire bikes. I was either mountain bike or BMX bike. And I, I was like, what the heck would anybody want to ride on those stupid bikes for? And it's just, uh, it's just something that's awesome. It, it, it made my, my recovery better and, um, uh, definitely made my life better. So how often were you riding down the road during this and you just look out at the beautiful countryside or maybe the skyline of a city or just whatever your surroundings are and just kind of just like, you know, wow, you know, thanking God, maybe how just how fortunate you are to be there. I guess that was a regular occurrence. So it definitely was a regular occurrence. Um, the ride was very interesting. So it had many factors to it. It had a, uh, it had some, you know, some individual factors of, you know, there was a lot of times you'd just be by yourself on a road, you know, riding. Um, they had incredible support for the ride, but, um, I mean, sometimes you just, you, you just feel like riding by yourself and you didn't feel like riding with a pack or talking and that silence, that solitude that, that you could find, um, in doing, you know, 50 to a hundred miles on your bicycle in a day. Um, and just doing that over and over and over again, gave you that that quiet time to to really think and to reflect on on your life and um you know the, the benefits of uh 
and I don't know the benefits, but just the opportunities that, that others have given you. And it just gave you that time to find peace <clears throat> or to make peace um, with whatever you wanted to make peace with. Um, you need definitely a lot of time to think about God and, and think about how, um, you know, things happen for a reason. Like if things really do happen for a reason, you know, why did this happen to me? And, and you really finding some satisfaction and, and some reason that, uh, that it, that it could have, you know, you know, happened for a reason, I guess. But, uh, it's something that certainly, uh, you had a lot of time to, to reflect. And, uh, there was so many times where you'd stop and you just like look out and you'd be like, wow. Um, well, there'd be times in, in the deserts where you would stop and you'd look out and you'd probably see for like 50 or 60 miles at the top of some, you know, mountain. You'd just be looking out at the road that you're gonna, you're about to ride on. And, uh, it was just unbelievable. Um, Probably some of my favorite favorite views were were in Colorado. Um, some awesome views in uh, California as well, but pretty much across the entire United States, whether it be in crossing Nebraska through all the different cornfields, or you know going through towns and just seeing all the people, it's it's definitely something that I, I can't explain with uh, with words. And it's something I definitely recommend for everybody to do. Yeah, I, I'm just, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around this. I, I, I heard a guy who's a famous kind of an adventure runner or an endurance runner, and uh, you'd probably know his name if I said it. I just, it slipped my mind. But he's he's the guy that's ran basically not only across the country, but he's ran in multiple continents. He's did, he, I think he did the 50 marathons in 50 days across the, you know, in every state and uh, it just kind of blows me away of how how you can do it and how your body holds up and then the, then the mental power too. I mean, what what was the feeling like when you finished it there at the end in Virginia Beach? So um, I think you know you get this this you know the the same feeling like when you began this. I can't believe this is happening. Like I can't believe we're about to do this. Uh, you have that same feeling when you when you finish. It's just I can't believe we're finishing. I can't believe we're about to do this. Um, you know, we're gonna you know dip the rear wheel in the Pacific and then dip the front wheel in the Atlantic. And you know, we all like talked about it that morning, like sitting there eating breakfast, talking about like I, you know, I can't believe this is happening. Like this is the day we're gonna right into Virginia Beach and then dip our front wheels and we're just you know making jokes of like oh I'm not dipping my front wheel. I'm gonna ride my bike into the ocean. <laughs> And it's, uh, it's just a, a surreal thing. And, and, you know, I don't think anybody wanted it to end. Um, we all grew, had grown pretty close together. Um, you know, there were some recumbent cyclists on the, on the ride where, you know, it was very, very hard for them to go up and down hills. Um, not so much down, uh, but definitely going up. It's a, it's a much heavier frame. You have much less, um, uh, advantage like physics wise um they can't stand up and, and give the same force as you know you, you can on an upright bike so we uh we developed different methods of, of helping them and you know it really didn't matter if you're going to finish first or last during that ride but it mattered if everybody would finish every ride and, and everybody didn't finish every route but um we tried like hell to make that happen and uh you know, every night we would usually ride into a town and there would be some kind of event in most towns where we'd sit down, like I said, and, and get to meet all these different people and we would sit and eat with them and talk. And then we'd go back to our rooms and do whatever. And then most of the time we would like all just jump on our bikes and ride to somewhere in the town and eat again. <laughs> uh, because I mean, we were burning anywhere from Oh God, I don't know, six to eight thousand calories a day. So you can imagine that you could not actually continue. You couldn't eat enough. Yeah. Uh, the entire time. So I think it was that, that teamwork, that, that bond that, that we established that was, uh, one of the hardest things to believe was going to end. And, you know, we've all stayed in touch. Um, unfortunately, um, 
my roommate throughout the entire ride. His uh, his injuries were were not combat related. Um, his name was Brian. Um, he actually he had a an issue that he went in the hospital for one day, and uh, they were gonna have to do a, a small surgery on his foot. And he woke up, and they actually had amputated his foot. And he was like, you know, he didn't expect that. Like he thought they were just gonna you know remove something. And, uh, it was a, a cancerous, uh, you know, tumor. And, um, you know, on that bike ride, he and I rode every single leg, every single inch we possibly could. And, um, I never, like, honestly, I think he put out more than anybody on the bike ride. And, uh, he was just, you know, super determined to, to be strong and recover and to, and to keep doing the things he was doing. And, um, you know, this year he actually lost his battle to cancer. Um, he had uh, he'd, he'd gone through many different uh, many different phases of cancer where he'd beaten it and then he'd come back and he'd beat it and then he'd come back and he'd done things uh, you know that normal people would never you know dream to do. Like I know he's ran marathons. He's he you know completed the Sea to Shining Sea bike ride and uh, he was going to school. Um, to get his degree, he actually returned to service after that bike ride and deployed as a crew chief or a loadmaster on a C-130s. Oh, I'm sorry, I think he was doing. Uh, I can't remember what he was doing. He may have been a navigator. I'm sorry. Uh, That's all right. I can't remember, but <clears throat> actually, yeah. So earlier this year, unfortunately, uh, he had lost the battle or his battle to cancer, but the one thing that he had taught me is that it doesn't matter how crappy something might get because, I mean, there were some days on that bike ride where, you know, everybody wanted to kill each other because it was just something happened, like a turn wasn't marked clearly and, like, we rode 20 miles out of our way, which meant 20 miles back and then continuing the ride. And it was like, <laughs> oh, some people just want to lose their minds, including myself. And you lose patience so easily, but he always had a way of redirecting that anger to, you know, just remind us like, Hey, what the heck are you mad about? Like your responsibility every day is to ride a bicycle and we're doing this and we get to do it across the country. And, uh, he never, uh, never showed anger, never showed frustration. And, uh, you know, th that taught me so many things. He was, uh, he was not a special operations guy. He was not a, you know, this high speed like uh, team dude. But I tell you, like, there's a lot of things I learned from him, and uh, you know, I'll hopefully pass on to the people that that I work with and the people that surround me. Wow. So, so I want to ask you, kind of a a long, broad question here to kind of start wrapping it up. And so I want you to take it how take it any direction you want but like what maybe you know what have you learned about yourself or about life you know if, from recovering from this injury um, what advice would you give others from going through uh, you know trials you know I mean did you avoid were you able to avoid the PTSD or, or, or if you didn't how did you you know how did you deal with that so maybe take that how you want Mark and kind of uh, just enlighten us <laughs> So some of the things I think I've learned throughout my recovery and and the things that it, that have really um, changed the way I am since being injured, um, I think uh, I think being injured and, and going through recovery, you're forced to grow up really quickly, um, and and what I mean by that is, you know realizing that it's not all about you and uh you know even in your recovery um you got to focus on yourself you got to focus on all these things but for me i was i was able to be successful physically and recover but the first you know seven eight you know nine months of recovery i didn't care about anybody anything I yelled at doctors, I yelled at family, I yelled at friends and, and people that, that cared about me. And uh, I didn't want anything to do with anybody. I just, I didn't care. Um, 
but when I started getting involved and, you know, doing things with some other people, I learned, you know, I, my injuries are, you know, nothing compared to this guy's or this girl's or, you know, I got nothing to complain about. Um, when I could finally like realize that, uh, you know, I have nothing to complain about and I'm, and I'm really lucky that I'm alive. Uh, that's when things started changing. And, you know, I've, I've said that, you know, cycling, for instance, has given me so much back and it's done so much to change my life. And, uh, in so many ways, um, I, I actually got a chance, uh, to take part in a, uh, BP MS 150 ride a few years ago. And if you don't know what that is, that's a like BP, the gas station, uh, or the company. Um, they do these mul- these rides for multiple sclerosis. Um, they're usually like 150 r- miles. Uh, they usually do it over two days. And the one I did was from Houston to Austin. And, uh, you know, I didn't even know what multiple sclerosis was. Um, I learned about it and, and I, I talked about it and, uh, you know, the biggest thing, you know, I talked to some folks with multiple sclerosis and the biggest things were like, you know, to me, like, it doesn't matter what injuries you have. It doesn't matter what you're overcoming, whether it be injury or, or something that's, you know, a hurdle to you. Um, the biggest thing you can do to overcome those things is to get up, get outside, get involved, go do something. It doesn't have to be cycling running or swimming it just you just have to get up and and get out there and do something and that you enjoy and that you you can contribute to and get others to enjoy and uh that'll that'll definitely um help you out in recovery and help you grow and um you know to me that was uh that was huge um i've gotten to become you know an advocate for wounded warriors i've i've worked for the SOCOM Care Coalition as a Wounded Warrior uh, liaison for for a few months um, before commissioning, and uh, I've, you know I've seen so many people going through all the different phases that I was going through in recovery, and you know going through their own injuries, um, both mental and physical, and um, you know the biggest thing is just you know talking with those guys and girls and explain like some of the things that are offered or available to them to to help in their recoveries and i'd say you know understanding what you're going through is going to definitely help in in recovery and uh and getting involved with whatever um there there are so many different opportunities right now that the wounded warriors can take advantage of and um you know at the end of the day realizing that every injury is different and that, you know, recovery for you might not be to get back to the team. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so blessed to, to have recovered to the point of, you know, where I'm at and and what I'm, what I'm able to do. But for everybody, uh, their, their recovery may not be the same. Um, but their recovery might mean, you know, getting out of the military and contributing to, to some other, you know, some other thing, some other, uh, effort. And that, that's got to give you pride and purpose. It can't be something that somebody can tell you is awesome and great. Uh, biggest challenge is, is, is when you get injured or when you're trying to overcome something is, is at the end of the day, you're going to have to do it yourself. And, uh, there's a lot of people out there that can help you, but at the end of the day, you just have to, you have to realize that it, it's up to you to get up and get out there and do something and, and to find out what your recovery is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, finally, I, I definitely want to say the one of the biggest things I'll, that happened in my recovery that I'll never forget and something that actually helps me is uh, I was sitting outside of Walter Reed one day and I was drinking some tea and I was doing a wheelie on my wheelchair and I really was just screwing around and um, I was by the bus stop waiting to take me back to the outpatient, like, like rooms, like where they, they keep you when you're doing therapy and stuff. And I was just sitting there is, you know, it's pretty cool out. Um, and there was a, like a Vietnam vet that was sitting on the bench near me and, uh, he got up and he like walked over to me and he like, said something about wheelies and I was like, oh yeah. And we just, 
we talked for a little bit and I explained to him like my story and he just told me that I, he hopes I get better and everything. And I was like, yeah, 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 no, I'm going to, I'm definitely getting better. You know, I'm going to go back to a team and he just, uh, he's like, that's awesome, man. He's like, that, that's really awesome. He's like, but he's like, you need to realize right now. And he got really serious and he's like, he's like, you got to realize something. He's like, this is going to haunt you for the rest of your life. He's like, you just got to be ready to deal with that. And I was like, Oh, Wow, yeah, man. Yeah, like, I get it. But he walked away, and I was just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, but for some reason, it just continued to play over my head. This guy telling me that these injuries or what had happened to me was going to haunt me for the rest of my life. And it was at that point I decided that, no, nothing's going to haunt me, that I won't allow it to haunt me. And that I'm going to make this what it is and I'm going to, I'm going to be better because of it. And for whatever reason, like I said, whether it's uh, me being spoiled or, or whatever, um, that's been one of the things that, you know, I always think about. And there are days where, uh, I'm in pain and my injuries still hurt. Um, and I try not to let anybody know about it. And, I don't think that uh, I don't think I would have been as strong having not been told that it was going to haunt me, because uh, yeah, I just at this at this point in my life, there's really nothing that I'm like limiting myself to. So that's uh, that's my story, and um, yeah, I just hope that if you know if I've affected anybody. Um, it's for the better and I've, I've tried to give a lot of people and going through recovery as much advice as I can. Um, but you know, everybody recovers differently and, um, you know, you may not get back to that life you once had, but you may have a better life on the other end and, and, you know, recovering to something else. Sure, so sure. that's been, that's been good to know for me. Thanks, Mark. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we close up? No, I just thank you for this opportunity. I'm glad I was able to get it scheduled. And I tell you, um, uh, with kids these days, I will say uh, most of the days I'm I'm just trying to spend time with you know the wife and and my son when I can. And uh, like things like this are, are super important to me. So. Uh, getting the time and, and being so patient, I, I really appreciate that. 